the Ghost, and I'm a podcaster on Anchor FM, and we have Bandit Lou, who is a sound and visual artist and producer based out of Brooklyn, New York. He crafts scenic soundscapes with modular synthesis, mixed with pianos and other acoustic instruments, and uh, we're going to get into the podcast right now. So when did you first get into music, and like what age? So I think got into music around maybe seven or eight. Um, I was classically trained um, to read sheet music. You know, I wasn't really classically trained to play jazz or improvise, but I read a lot of sheet music uh, for my piano teacher at the time. He was an older man, and I think he really just enjoyed the company and just having, you know, his students play him songs that he loved to hear. And um, yeah, you know, that's where I kind of learned how to be um, expressive. He was really on top of us for just being really expressive, you know, and not just reading the sheet music and more about interpreting it in our own way and, you know, putting our own little zest to it. But um, I think that's that's great about teachers, you know, because I, I had a I was in a concert band when I was young and I started on clarinet and, you know, it was a, I was in the wind section of like mm-hmm. a concert band. And then later I got to be in a marching band. And the difference was the marching band was kind of more like jazz because we we could be we could re, we would learn the song and then we were allowed to kind of just bring our expression to it. Mm-hmm. And I always liked leaning toward like the, the the marching band and the jazz band were more like I loved that and the you know the classical band you know the, the concert band was cool because it taught you you know structure and taught you like the basics but it is like in terms of just the passion of it the expressiveness of um just going out there and having a little more feel I understand where you're coming from there <laughs> yeah I actually played the clarinet also <laughs> I think we basically did the same thing I, I didn't I didn't really get into jazz till much later in my my music uh, journey, but you know I, I did play band um, middle school and high school, and I, and I did partake in the marching band. So it was it was kind of fun, you know. It's it was different, um, but you know I think I've you know back to the expressiveness. I always kind of really paid attention to that for whatever reason, you know. It just I think that was the fun part of playing music and you know, it just adds a little bit of something um, that you really can't put your finger on, but you can definitely feel it when you listen to someone who's really um, good on an instrument. Yeah, I mean, it's been my, the whole dynamic in my career in music has been to kind of go into very experimental, kind of off-kilter, progressive type stuff that, that kind of merges multiple genres. And a lot of it is kind of feel based. Mm-hmm. You know, all the bands I've ever been in have been more like jam bands or progressive bands that try to do innovative kind of, you know, change in the the key and change in the tempo in the mid mid song and going into another song and then coming back and just you know doing that rather than trying to be like a pop band yeah. or having like a, a punk aesthetic that, to to be a little bit more emotional mm-hmm. um, than to be more pop oriented you know the pop pop ideas like the Beatles you know those are those are cool ideas to have structure but I've kind of spent most of my career trying to do kind of very unstructured stuff yeah <laughs> but um so you started you know on, on the piano you're classically trained you had a teacher that was trying to get you to like get into that feel when did you realize that you had a talent for like creating your own music, like writing your own tunes. Cause some people get into music and they become a session musician. They become like a concert classical musician or a cover band. Like when did you think that you wanted to like write your own composition? Um, I think probably college, like a- after my piano lessons and after, you know, band, I, I basically stopped being in band, you know, my, I guess my senior year in high school and you know by that time you know my piano teacher you know already passed you know so i kind of just didn't really i didn't really play much you know um my i had a friend who was very much into music production um you know making beats at the time 
And I remember him going over and he showed me Fruity Loops. And I was like, oh, this is cool. But it never really inspired me to do anything more. And um, I think for whatever reason, you know, sometime, you know, in college, um, freshman year in college, you know, I, I got like, a, you know, I bought a, a MacBook, you know, like those white plastic mm-hmm. MacBooks and it had, <laughs> yeah, um, had garage band on it and i started playing around with garage band i was like oh this is fun you know just putting um you know drum beats over acapellas and and things like that nothing too crazy and from there you know i just gradually got deeper and deeper um into it you know learning more you know i found reason um right propeller head reason i think it was like reason three or reason four and Mm -hmm. i made a few things on there and then i found ableton and um you know i got into yeah i mean the it was just a rabbit hole right you know i just so you started you start so you started on the garage band and you were in the DAW in the digital audio workstations what made you make the jump to like the hardware modular kind of rabbit hole oh um, you know, I, you know, I think, I, you know, I started out on GarageBand, banging away on like just the, the typing keyboard, you know, nothing too crazy. And then when I got Reason, you know, I was like, oh, there are these things called MIDI controllers. You know, I got, I remember like, I found like a cheap used Axiom. It's like the Axiom 49. Mm-hmm. It was really janky. It was half broken. And you know, I wasn't a fan of the 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 key bed on it, but you know, it, it did its job. You know, I had a little drum pad, and um, you know, I got into Ableton, and then I got my first sampler, which was the SP four hundred four. Oh, that's a great and, one. That's, that's a good. One. I like the classic one. And then I picked up like an Alesis Micron, you know, and that was my first like hardware synth. I remember seeing, mm-hmm. uh, watching. Dorian Concept. I don't know if you're familiar with Dorian Concept. I don't know if he's still making music, but he's, um, you know, he was like... He used that. He used that a lot. Yeah, he, he had like these awesome YouTube videos where, I mean, you know, he's clearly a very good jazz keyboardist um, to begin with, but the stuff he was cranking out of like the Alesis Micron and the Micro Korg, you know, just playing, it was just like really inspiring. So, you know, I was able to get mm-hmm. my hands on a, a Micron. And then, it, yeah, it's just a rabbit hole. You know, I, you know, had... I'm kind of interested in your modular gear. What, what like, the first modular? So modular gear. is um, pretty recent. Um, you know, I've been making music for almost 10 years now. You know, I definitely started in synthesis. You know, I made a lot of beats. I went through a, a sampler phase where I you know, was obsessed with like trying different samplers. And then I finally got like a Nord piano. And then I was really interested in just, you know, pianos, you know, and just, Mm -hmm. you know, classic drum breaks and organic sounds. And uh, recently, you know, I was just looking for something different. You know, I took a hiatus from making music for, you know, I would say almost three years. And, you know, coming back into it, um, you know, I still, I still have some of my synths, but I was like, uh, you know, I want to try something different. I remember reading up on, you know, module, you know, I, well, I think what it was is, um, I was trying to do more experimental music, less percussion driven. Mm -hmm. I think I was a little Mm -hmm. burnt out from making quote unquote beats Beats. and, um, (laughs) yeah, you know, I was like, I want something to like explore. And, you know, I was watching a lot of videos on modular synthesis, you know, I got like an app, you know, use VCV rack. And then I was like, you yeah. know, I, I should just take the plunge. And I got um, a little make noise skiff. And um, oh, cool. What, what, can you, do you have a math? Yes, I, I love maths. Actually, I actually have two. I have two maths. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I just got the morphogene, so I have a math. And a yeah, morphogene. I mean, the maths and the morphogene are a, a nice combo. You can do a lot of different stuff. But yeah, it's just, you know, slowly kind of just getting lost mm-hmm. in the design process. 
Uh, well, I think it gets you kind of back in the day because, like, I I'm I'm in my fifties, right? So, I I kind of grew up with bands like Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and I used to look at Keith Emerson and his big Moog Model Fifty Five rig, right? Mm-hmm. And that's like the and Model Twos and Model Ones, and I used to like, wow, that's that's what I want, right? So, yeah. so when Mo, when Moog put out the Mother Thirty Two, and then they put out the DFAM, I went and got like a skiff from like an Arturia 6U yeah. and I load those two in with my make noise more for DNA my mass. And then I, I put like a Pittsburgh modular four by four VCA mixer. Okay. And then I linked it to an Arturia mini brew two S and then I linked it to a grandmother and then I linked it to a system one. M, And then I started going down a real rabbit hole with my Juno and all my other stuff. But um, it's just what I liked about it was the ability to kind of build your own tones and with all the LFOs and all the different tricks you can do with modular, uh, you know, just creating analog clips yeah. or analog sequences that, you know, with the maps, you can go crazy with how, how you can manipulate that. And uh, I just found that that was so satisfying compared to sampling or compared to just using straight pads out of my mm-hmm. Juno. Uh, I said, you know, that is something I wanted. And it kind of goes back to the original birth of subtractive synthesis was done on machines like that that had no keyboards. Yeah. You know, that's that's where it started. So it's kind of going full circle with all these people in the module. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And I think the other aspect of what intrigued me with modular is self-generating, um, you know, yeah. rhythms. And I've been trying to delve more into that, just using things to modulate different control voltages to kind of just like self-resonating you know well even just you know like modulating um you know my sequencer rate uh division to give it like swing you know just modulating oh yeah yeah your mats are good filter cutoffs and especially on the morphogene you can literally automate like almost every single function you know i i have a tempe that i use with the morphogene and Mm -hmm. i just you know just route everything into the, the the cv's and um it yeah you just literally just play one riff and you let morphogene kind of do its thing you know you put it through a reverb yeah i like the randomization yeah. with it like when you're going you morph it you can have something at one speed and then by the time it gets into it start slowing it or speeding it up and if you if you rewire it and you trigger it with lfos from something else you can have all kinds of other things going on um so I, 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 what I like about the Make Noise products is it kind of brings like East Coast and West Coast synthesis together. If you're into that, like that Buglin mm-hmm. style versus mm-hmm. the Moog mm-hmm. style, it, it seems like the Make Noise products kind of bridge that. Like if you're in my, if I'm on my Moog, I'm like I'm stuck on on, on uh, you know East Coast, you know subtractive synthesis. But as soon as I get into my make noise products and suddenly I can start doing bukla ass yeah, stuff. Absolutely. Uh, which do you find that, that you like the bukla style or you don't you just kinda go wherever you um, want to go versus like what East Coast, West West Coast, do you have any kind of consideration so on that? So I also have a um a Moog Matriarch and Oh that's awesome. That's awesome. I got a grandmother I mean, though. you know, when when I heard the grandmother, <laughs> it was just you know, I, I used to have a little fatty um, that was my first Moog ever. That was like my, you know, huge. That's a great Moog. That's a great yeah. Moog to have. I mean, every Moog has its own character. It's actually still, you, you don't have to get rid of it. You can still uh, keep it. I mean, I sold it off. It just didn't do it for me. You know, I, yeah. you know, I found. But a matriarch can pretty much do it. You can do it. You can make it do it. You, you know, whatever it did, you can get the matriarch. Yeah, it. but it's like, you know. You know, it's just like the Model D and stuff like that. It's like, oh man, you know, I want the Model D just for like the raw tone. But then you realize yeah. there's like, <laughs> what is it? Like Contact Monarch, I think is what it's called. You know, you you play that, you're like, oh, this sounds good enough. <laughs> you know, but yeah. even now, like Ber- uh, Berenger, you know, I I got the the Boog uh, from my brother-in-law, and I mean, we got the Poly no, D. I, I got the 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 single voice one. Uh, oh the single voice but i mean it it's like man i don't need to dish out 5k for for i mean you know maybe in the future if 
I just end up with like absolute infinite, you know, flexibility with my finances, you know, I'll, I would buy. Well, Mug One, sixteen voice Mug One. I kind of that's like my holy grail. Between that and the Profit yeah. Ten, I kind of go back and forth every day. It's like, which <laughs> one would I get? You know, if I was gonna get one, and one day, you know, I'm saying that well, having three cents with sixteen voices on top of each other, that's yeah. kind of cool. And then, then, then you start thinking about the way the ten sounds. It what it doesn't sound like the Mug, and the Mug doesn't sound like it. So you kind of may have to make a decision mm-hmm. which which direction, kind of like whether or not you wanted to use a Jupiter or an OBS, yeah. right? The different they they all they, you could all use them all, and they all have different like like getting a guitar like different bottles of guitars you get them for certain mm-hmm. reasons, right? And I think you, you when you get those scents you kind of picking like a brand or a style of synthesis that evokes something like oh I want to do a Duran Duran type of thing so I want a Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Eight. Right, you know, or I want something that's more, you know, like Eddie Van Halen. So I want to, I want to go get a, you know, over. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. you know, you never know what you, what you want. So you try to find someone. Well, can I find someone can do everything? And there's never anything that does everything. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the other thing is too. It's like you know, I've gone through phases where I've pared down a lot of gear, and then, you know, got an influx of gear, then pared down again, and you know. I used to be like, oh, I want everything out. But now after every session, I put everything away. So I'm very deliberate in what I choose, you know, to give myself, you know, a limitation. A different yeah, way, different to, way go. to go. But, you know, like the Moog, the, the Moog sound, I mean, I, it just fits my, like, especially the matriarch. It fits yeah, your aesthetic. Like, like the grandmother <laughs> and the matriarch. It's like when I heard the oscillators, you know, the recordings of the oscillators. Yeah, there's nothing yeah, like those. Like, <laughs> you know, compared to the little fatty, like it, these made me feel. Well, the spring reverb, the spring reverb does it for me, yeah. grandmother. What you can do with that real spring reverb, I find new ways to use it like every day. Um, and then the FM sim- synthesis implementation mm-hmm. on it, it's not like a DX7, but it does some really yeah. cool stuff that you, I never, you know, like the Model D mm-hmm. doesn't do that. Um, and so that in itself, you know, I, I was kind of torn between getting that and, and the Matrix, but I really wanted that spring reverb because there was certain stuff I wanted yeah. to do. Um, and so, but I, I mean, I, the Matrix is one that I was lusting after. I did want it. But limitations, I think another thing I like is I, the reason I bought DFAM was because I like the limitations on that drum machine. Um, because those limitations actually give you more yeah, ideas. Absolutely. <laughs> it gives you a creative way to work with it and you know, it's a little more, yeah, you, you just get something different out of it. But I mean, lately I've been taking a teenage engineering OPZ mm-hmm. and then sampling the beats on it into oh, the morphogen. Nice. That's cool. And then running the maths to like change the beats totally by using the math to really alter the sample from the OPZ. Oh, that's cool. And I find it's like taking that kind of, I like to take things. I will take something from my Juno and sample it. And I'll take like I'll take my uh, you know the LFOs off my Arturia Minibu 2S and have that run mm-hmm. the DFAM. Um, it's just like so many different ideas. Yeah, sometimes I just pull all my wires out. Like I'll have something patched up. And I'll take a picture of it, put it in my little book, and then I'll just start all yeah. over again. <laughs> I usually unpatch after every session mm-hmm. and just start fresh. <laughs> I put everything away at, at the end of every session. It's like at least for the modular stuff. You know, it's. If if I'm yeah, working on a long term yeah. project, or if I was, you know, someone, one, you know, commissioned me to do something, it's a different story. But you know, with modular stuff, I think the fun in it is the unexpected accidents and just the. Yeah, I think it. I always tell people that my modular gear is like a member yeah. of the band, right? Because like when I turn on my modes, it's like I don't know what you guys are going to give me today. But I kind of go with where yeah. they're going. So it's like I start playing with something and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna go with that. Instead of trying to make it sound like mm-hmm. somebody else. What I did, I was I was talking to this guy before and he said, you let the instrument be what mm-hmm. it is. Right. And if you let the instrument be what it is, then I, I saw like a review of the new Strega. 
yeah for make noise and one of the lady a lady on the youtube that was talking about saying she was trying to make it sound like a bukla but it wasn't doing what she thought it was going to do and then suddenly she said well i understand let it be what it is and once she let it be what it is then she said okay now i understand what this thing does because i'm not trying to make it into you know, yeah i mean you know they're all tools <laughs> with its quirks um you know it, it depends what you want you know and it, it depends on the person's style of producing or creating you know with modular stuff yeah it's like i like using you know the cvs you know tempe and the lfos to kind of crank out something and then i'll work around it you know make a tune out of it and i think that's it's a little bit of a break from my usual production, which is start with a, make a drum loop, you know, add a chord progression. Yeah. That's like the traditional, the traditional, everything starts with the drums. I was talking to some guy and he said he spends like two months yeah. on the drums. And I, and I can see that because a lot of producers I've talked to, they spend all their time trying to get the kicks and the snares and the cymbals and the hi-hats. They spend tons of time doing that. And they were, and I understand why, because if you get that right, then you pretty much have it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, you know, a lot of rhythm-based music, it's like, it's all in the drums. You know, if, if you can, you know, just hearing drum, you know, like drum circles, like, you know, you don't need much to really move somebody, you know. It's like, you know, yeah. My whole thing is like, if you can get get it to sound as good as a Motown drummer, then you're probably in the right yeah. way. Because <laughs> yeah, like they, 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 I always go back to the Motown like Stax soul mm -hmm. drummers, and what they could do in three oh, minutes, yeah. and what they did is like it seems very simple, but when you look at their styles like Purdy yeah. Shuffle from Motown, it's like there's certain techniques they had that within those three minutes are like they're very hard to replicate, um, just because they had this human factor. And this, you know, ability that came from jazz, that came from the blues, and then it got brought into soul and soul pop. And, you know, that's where everybody's trying to, to get that kind of hit beat that these Motown guys could just, like the Funk Brothers, they could just do it, you know. But um, there's this old, when, I, when I was listening to Bedtime Zen mm -hmm. that you, you have out there, and it's kind of what I like because it's like a 44-minute, like, progressive kind of rock type of thing and i like how you use noise um at the beginning you know you have all this kind of white pink noise blue noise however you want to describe the noise everybody has different aspects of how they describe pink noise or white noise but do you find that you like to use noise in 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 modular experiments for that type of feel um i think my aesthetic usually has a layer of noise um i think it just fills a certain spectrum it kind of fills out the, the spectrum, I, at least for my aesthetic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I like using noise. Um, yeah, it just kind of, it's like a... The, the kind of percussive nature of noise. I mean, I think when you're using like Moogs and analog gear, there's a very interesting percussive nature to like like the analog waveforms or the analog yeah. noise compared to like maybe digital noise. It just has this warmth to it, like everything that's analog. And there's ways that you can use it that are can be unexpected or can be kind of like a shadow track or they can be like, you know, they can just bring to the whole picture, like you're, if you want like Phil Spector layering yeah. right, of your composition and noise is like, it has like a floor of it. You know, like people will go back and use old tape machines to get the hiss, you know, to get this kind of noise, noise floor into the recording, you know, because that they want that aspect to be there because bring a character to the song. Yeah, I mean, like my um, older work, what I would do is that at the very end, you know, I would sample some, you know, noise and I would stretch it out and I would just put it slightly above or like you know slightly before you don't hear it anymore like the the the, the audio level mm -hmm. out of and, range yeah get it kind of slightly out of out you know range. i'll yeah. you know bit crush it to make it a little more crunchy and fuzzy and it at least for me i think it it adds something it, it's it's the you know it's like when you talk about like bernard purdy you know drumming in the old motown drummers you know what makes you know, a mo or what makes Bernard Purdy different than, you know, a drum machine, yeah. 
right? You know, like a TR-808. Yeah, it's a There's, human factor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not even just the human factor. It's just like the little details. And I, you know, I've been... Boy, well, his are uh, Yeah, genius, you know, like the ghost notes, <laughs> you know, the different types of hits, you know, just like the little, little things that, like the little details that you really can't produce on, you know, an EXO, you know, step sequencer, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, I've been, tr I've been on the search for like a nice, you know, like the perfect drum machine that I could use with my modular, you know, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like, I like playing the drum, like hitting, you know, finger drumming because I. Finger cause, drumming. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Not it's just sec. like the swing, you know, like I'm very particular about, you know, my drums and the, the timing. And in some cases I can make a drum machine work, but it's like, it's too rigid and it's too sterile like you know one of my influences you know jay dilla you know his and you know even flying mm -hmm. lotus it's like their you know their drum beats are not necessarily sloppy but it's loose and you know there's a, a yeah. push pull and there's something interesting about it you know you, you hear four four on the floor kick drum and a snare in every two you know it, you know that doesn't really move me i mean sometimes it does but you know well, that's why I think I always liked um, like Moon, yeah. Keith Moon. Because if you think about Keith Moon in mm -hmm. The Who, he never kept time. He basically was soloing through every Who track. And he, he's not a traditional drummer. You know, he, he basically was a solo yeah. lead drummer. And the same thing with like Mitch Mitchell with the Jimi Hendrix experience. And I like that kind of sloppiness. It's kind of like the way Keith Richards doesn't play a straight rhythm guitar, mm -hmm. you know. He has this kind of bluesy, kind of off kilter, a little bit off the beat. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of like when you listen to Neil Young and Crazy Horse on Tonight's The Night. And it's like, it's that kind of chaos. It's kind of like that glitchy yeah. beat. I, I, I've always been into the type of rock music that's very glitchy or it's kind of off kilter, like the Velvet Underground. Um, and that kind of imperfection is the perfection well, yeah me. i mean that's what i'm talking about that's like the the little detail that um you know makes it a little yeah you know, i you know it, I, I can go on and on about this but i think it's like what makes a loop boring is that you don't change it up you know you can do you know i i did you know my other um alias andy angulus i have a, a track called vibe out and it was kind of an experiment where you know, all I did, it was the same, it was the same um, melodic loop, uh, the same sample, just over and over again. Um, the time signature is a little wonky, so it doesn't really line up. But the, you know, I just cut up like a dozen drum breaks. And I just, oh, and you um, come around. yeah, you know, I put each, you know, I just sequence, you know, play the first loop, then play the second loop, then play the third loop. So throughout the whole song, you know, it was just, you know, after you know, four to eight bars it would switch the drum loop. And what's interesting is that, you know, in loop based music, if you just change something like a little thing, it won't ever get boring because, you know, once you hear like eight bars, your brain is going to say, Hey, I know what to predict. I don't need to pay attention anymore. You know, this is boring. That's why I like poly yeah. polyrhythmic stuff like the subharmonicon. Like this, if you take a subharmonicon, with its polyrhythm mm -hmm. generators and then you link that yeah. to like a DFAM and then you run it through like a morphogene. Then you, what I tend to do is I use DFAMs and put a lot of randomness mm -hmm. into my DFAMs. So the limitation of only being able to do eight steps, but then having it run through the morphogene and then I glitch it out a little bit. So I, I try to get it to sound more organic by creating kind of this glitchiness or changing the tempo or being more progressive like a band like yes actually changing yeah. it and and triggering it to change to a slower beat and then coming back and then going and then they, it doesn't do what you do you see like in trap and edm and all these all these other types of electronic music today that say that they're the electronic music form but if you go back to like original electronic music it was never just like four on the four all the you know doing that same thing all the time but it was yeah, always, always experimentation and i think um, the main thing is keeping the listener's brain not necessarily conscious brain but unconscious brain kind of on its toes and i think 
Well, I think it's the difference between dance music and, you know, electronic music. There's a type of electronic yeah. music that's dance music, but then there's a type of electronic music that's always been progressive and experimental. Mm-hmm. And that is not necessarily going to get the dance crowd. There's a place and time for it. For yeah, it's gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different, different type of vibe. It's a different crowd. You know, the modular crowd will go 20 minutes, 40 minutes into like ambient mm-hmm. feedback. You know, <laughs> and and all kinds of strangeness that you know that's not going to get the dance crowd going. But uh, some guy in Berlin or Paris in a small club yeah. is going to be into that. You know, and so it's a different niche market, you know, what you're trying to do. You do backgrounds and movies and films and TV. You're more, you know, doing stuff that's kind of not that it's background music. It can, it can be Brian Eno-esque, you know. You look at what yeah. Eno does. You know, I'm a big fan of Brian. It's like that is kind of where the world I like to be in, you know, because I think it just mm-hmm. leaves it open and expansive. You know, the whole idea of expansive sound is that you got to pull some jazz in pull some rock in and pull some hip hop, some soul, whatever you feel like. And you just do what you feel you want to do at the moment, wherever it serves the song. Absolutely. You, you, yeah. I mean, you're saying that I, I saw your influence by, you know, Jay Dillon and Tom York. I think that's a really good name check because you listen to radio oh, yeah. records. And I also hear some kind of Wilco, like Yankee hotel, Foxtrot type of stuff going on, you know, summer teeth. I'm not type familiar of with them. Um, well, they they do somewhat like Radiohead type of work. They're they're kind of a an experimental American rock band that started off okay. as a country rock band, and then with Yankee Hotel Foxtrot okay. is their most famous album. It's a really glitched out rock record that does they 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 wrote the record and then they deconstructed the record and ended up doing backward tape looping and like George mm-hmm. Martin type production. It's kind of re- deconstructed almost every song and added all these layers of strange tape loops and backward vocals. And and it became a very experimental record. Oh, interesting. The record company didn't even want to put it out, but Rolling Stone said it was like one of the best records of the, of the, of the two thousands. Um, and it's, and if you like Radiohead, oh, I yeah, think you'd like it. So it's, it, I, I, I I do hear some of that, and, and some of your like escapism and bedtime zen. You've got some aspects that have that sound, which I, I'm totally into, like the loose rhythms and the lush mm-hmm. subharmonics. <laughs> but um, yeah, it just seems like you know I, I I'm always going down that modular rabbit hole because it's kind of where I live. Um, but it's hard today, you know, with so many people trying to do two minute songs. I was kind of very heartened. When I saw your forty-four <laughs> minute song, yeah, I mean it's there. <laughs> you know, like I said, I was, you know, I've been trying really hard to take a departure from my old habits. Um, and I think the thing is with like self-generating, you know, even using like you know sequencers and randomizing the sequencers, I'm just trying to more or less, you know, forget break habits of like the chords, the common chords I play, you know, on the piano. It's like, I'm just trying to, you know, that's why I made, you know, Bandit Lou in general is just like, I don't want to do what I normally know how to do. I want to do something completely different. You know, I started adding percussion again and it was like kind of sounding like what my other stuff sounded like. And I was like, ah, maybe I should just not do it anymore, but it's, you know, but like percussion, you know, I think percussion just ad- it adds another dimension. You know, it's not necessary, but I think, yeah. you know, I I kind of want to add a little something more other than, you know, ambient, you know, trances, right? So I, yeah, you know, I think I'm ch- juggling and struggling on finding a way to make something different. Um, and well, I think like what, what you do with the morphogen you know, what I love about the Morphogen is like, I, I've been doing a lot of rhythmic stuff with the Morphogen mm-hmm. using it like a drum machine. Um, and I find that if you're doing stuff where you're like, okay, I don't want drums, but then if you take the Morphogen and you do what it does with drums, it kind of gives you what you were looking for. You didn't want that predictable beat. You want mm-hmm. something that's a little off. And I think it, it I found that using something like the OPZ to give me the beat, right? And I could build a very structured beat on the OPZ, but then I bring it into the OP, into the Morphogen, and then suddenly I can just totally rip it yeah. up. And uh, 
that's been between that and and the DFAM. I I've, I've been using those. I mean, I have 808s and 909s and 727s, and sometimes I go back to those because I want to make more mm-hmm. traditional songs. Um, but I find in the last six months I've been in my my DFAM OPZ morphine mode. Uh, just because I find that I like the unexpected coming out of these machines compared to the expected stuff I get out of my 909s and my 2727s yeah. and stuff like that. I think I should get another morphogene. I think that's what this uh, is turning into <laughs> the conclusion. I should get another well, it's morphogene. Just like people, <laughs> people get like two or three yeah. DFAMs and then they then when you have like three of them on top of each other, you you ha- it's kind of like you got this super like analog yeah, drum machine. It, they cost you like yeah, 1800 bucks. <laughs> you know, I've been trying to focus on less is more. I, I went through a phase of two or three years. You know, this is on my other um, alias, Andy Ongulus, is, um, you know, you know, I went down a rabbit hole of the Roland samplers, like the SP series. Um, and I mm-hmm. discovered the SP 303. Um, this is before. That's like a great yeah. machine. Everybody uses that. That's you know, like this classic. is before I knew about Madlib, really. Um, but what I loved about the SP three hundred three was that you can resample the pads while sampling the, an external input. So it was essentially, you know, a two track in one box. Um, so yeah, I think that's why a lot of people like that machine because you can kind of you can use yeah. them live. And you can use like a DJ, and you can. I see a lot of people use it. Yeah, so way. like I, I just made music with just literally electric pianos and a drum, uh, a drum break. I'll chop up the drum break, use the, those drums, make my own drum break, and then just resample and uh, record. You know, me playing the piano and just using the onboard effects and just really mangling it. And you know, that was a lot of fun. You know, I. I, I didn't need like a, all the plugins that I had, you know, I, you know, I, I was living in a smaller space. I was living in just like a tiny bedroom in, uh, in Brooklyn at the time. And, um, yeah, you know, and I made a lot of music just on that. And it was, it was a lot of yeah, fun. You can, you know, a lot of people don't realize, I mean, you can take, I mean, I started with like a Casio CZ 101 and a Tascam yeah. four tracker. <laughs> And I just kept on overdubbing yeah, stuff just on the overdub. tape. It's the that's, greatest feeling. <laughs> that's, I, I, and I, just having that little CZ one hundred and one, that thing was a little powerhouse. You know, it was like the cheapest way to get into like subtractive synthesis back in the day, and it actually could do it. And so then, if you just and I would just go and like I like mute and unmute my Tascam and play yeah. to it as shows. So I actually had my Tascam. I'd put down like a drum track on it and then I'd maybe mute the bass line and then play the bass line live and then let some of the other things come through and kind of mute and unmute tracks. I've seen a guy from like, I think Alexander uh, Cortini from Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. He actually does that for some Nine Inch Nails songs. He actually has like a task cam on stage and he has tape cassettes and he unmutes and mutes tracks on his task cam while he's doing his like yeah. music directing. It's awesome. <laughs> Is it just an alternative method? He said he liked it better than his computer because he knew it. He knew it was not yeah. going to crash on him. You know that he was going to be able to do it. And I kind of do the same thing with my um. I use like a mm-hmm. Zoom R twenty four, so I use my Zoom R twenty four like yeah. a Task M twenty four, and I'll just mute and unmute tracks, and it's like dead reliable because it's not. It's never going to have yeah, a it's, CPU it's crash. It's a simpler machine, you know. Yeah, so if you go to play live, I, I played live in New York with it. And I had like a Beat Step Pro running like 808 stuff on top of it. And then I had my modes and all my other stuff. But you know, like I was able to do a one-man show running all these like different things, like different sequencers running on different time signatures running with the tape. And you're able to do this kind of, you know, experimental kind of modular show um, that feels different than a DJ. Because you still have the the live, you know, experimentation and and also being able to just, uh, you know, you just you kind of riff, and so I could take my bass song and then I could kind of go wherever I want to go with it, and not be stuck to like some Ableton Live thing that I'm kind of stuck in. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, um, it's. I think it all comes down to 
like I I know producers who only used Ableton Live and only the Ableton Live stock tools and they make amazing 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 music um but i think it just comes down to preference you know i yeah i mean it's i i think i mean it's like i guess i i grew up in the world of yeah. having the hardware and so i tend to be a more of a hardware guy because i just have a better experience with it and i do appreciate there are guys that can use these dogs in very creative ways mm-hmm. not that you can't it's just it's like a personal preference i just like I like having all the controls uh, of these modular sense and even, you know, hardware analog sense, you know, that to yeah, me, it's the a different surface. experience. I think it's a different thing. And it's just a ch- choice I make to be able to do that. Not that you can't control a DAW and have all kinds of mini mm-hmm. controllers doing the same thing, but it's just something about when you have a real Moog, like, you know, with your matriarch or a grandmother, it's something about when you play that live, there's some things you can't replicate from performance to performance. And that's kind of what I like about it. The only thing about the matriarch is, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I don't need presets or save presets. And then yeah, it's like, <laughs> well, actually, sometimes, sometimes do. I do. Cause <laughs> you know, especially when I'm setting up for like a, like a live stream or something, you know, uh, right now, a lot of, a lot of modular co- communities are doing a lot of live streams. And then it's like, oh, I'm ready to live stream. And then you, press down you're just like oh wait i forgot to turn like five knobs i lost, I lost this yes you forgot <laughs> you forgot which knobs you yeah. turned and didn't turn it's like oh god i can't remember the patch well, well that's where our profit with the profit fives and yeah. the jupiters the kind of brilliance of those was that you actually yeah. could save the pad mm-hmm. and it was still analog and so i think those those type of go-to poly analog sense always have like a place you know i've got my juno and i kind of have it because i need presets um and so i'll have my juno run all that but then when i know i want to run my leads or my strangeness and then all my analog stuff is like for that but when i want to have something stable yeah. and then i use my juno um and i think everybody who has a set they kind of got to have your stable thing that can yeah. give you a grand piano they can give you the pad you need you know that however you do that whether you do it through ableton or whatever but yeah, I think they, I think you you can use all of these tools, you know. I think I think that's the thing. It's not one over the others. Like a guy using a vinyl DJ uh, mm-hmm. instead of a CDJ. Well, there's a place for the for the digital CDJ, but there's also yeah, a place course. for the vinyl because it's going to give you a different feel, you know. It is, so it's like one doesn't supplant the others. Mm-hmm. Like you can't use them all. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Um, in terms of your, I know you've escapism is your 2021 20, single that I've seen out there. Are you working on other projects uh, for 2021? So, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly live streaming. Um, actually I, I'm in this group that's called earth modular society and it's, it's really awesome. Cool. It's an awesome community. Um, you know, you have all these other modular communities to which are equally awesome, but these guys, um, you know, it's basically an open mic uh, to streaming. Um, you know, you kind of join the Discord. You can you can search for us. I think we're uh, EMS dot com. Let me double check. Oh, well, send me send me the link, and I uh, can I I do I go on Twitch myself, and you probably see my stuff on Instagram. I'll go and take my Twitch and my YouTube's and my Facebook lives, and then split, cut them up, and then make videos yeah. out of them. But um. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing stuff on Periscope yeah, since this, like 2016. The, our, our website is earthmodularsociety.com, and you'll find a link to our Discord. And, you know, what's cool is, um, yeah, it's like an open mic. We have a 24-7 uh, YouTube and Twitch, and basically they, they, um, sh- they stream uh, each other. So usually, you know, we have everyone joins the YouTube, but it pushes it to Twitch too. So if you want to watch it on Twitch... But yeah, it's an open mic. You join, and um, you know if you if you feel like doing a patch from scratch, you know you can join in and do that. Or if you have an idea you want to share, you can do that. If you want to play one song, you can do that. If you want to do a two hour set, you, you can do that. So it's kind of fun. So wow. I've been just that's cool. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I mean, I've been doing my own thing, but I'd love to yeah. get into a collective. It's kind of been something I've been wanting to do. And I like to focus on collective. One thing I can do for you guys is like if each guy, each person in the collective wants wants like me to talk to him, oh, do sure. an interview, I can do that. 
I did that one time with, with the monster tea party party out of France. We actually had like three or four guys from this art collective in France. And I actually did some podcasts with them back in 2017. Um, so they, yeah, I'm into oh, cool. doing that. I'll, I'll let them know. But, you know, in terms of like my body of work, you know, the last year and a half I've been, you know, I, I only recently got a modular um, synthesis. So, you know, I'm so wrapping my head around a lot of the modules and just making them work. And, you know, the live mm -hmm. streaming platform is just like an awesome place to get better in general. So, yeah, it's like, I love, I, I watch these guys in Berlin all the time and they're like, you know, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like, you know, it, it is kind of harkens back to the days, you know, back in the fifties mm -hmm. when the first modes came out and the New York musicians, you know, they all did these kind of yeah. very experimental shows. Yeah. Um, they kind of, yeah, ended up getting like the Keith Emerson coming out of that and, but, and all these other guys that were into that stuff. You know, but but it's just uh, it's cool to see people who back into that because, you know, for a long time, you just had guys, that, you know, the DJs and the EDM crowd was to kind of take it over mm -hmm. the moniker of electronic music without people understanding the depth of electronic music. It's not just one type of genre, it's multiple things. Um, and I think it's cool for people to hear, like when I do my podcast, I like to bring out like all types of music and a lot, you know, today I think it's it's a cool thing to see you know people yeah doing CV again, <laughs> people people talking about tape, you know people people saying like you know maybe I'm just gonna put that mm -hmm. directly to a reel, um and and I'm like well, that that just really makes me feel good because not not that I'm into this reminiscing on the old stuff I think it just gives you a different way to approach things, um so however you approach music and i think you can like i said all things can happen today you mm -hmm. could use ableton with a tape like a a, a reel to reel and you, you could record something with a walkman you know <laughs> you could use a plastic guitar it doesn't really matter it depends on like your musical uh yeah. a, a, you know capability with it is kind of what it is yeah you know i mean yeah so like my you know i'm just having fun right now like you know i i do have like um an ep or you know an album in process but you know i'm really just having fun you know like a standard ep with like you know two to four minute songs um but okay so you do you gotta do some more traditional stuff i i do like the stuff that yeah. you have out there right now i mean that's fun to do yeah, yeah the, the longer yeah with well, the longer form songs is kind of like a it's a bit it's a niche you know like I have stuff I, I, I do through like my relationship with other distributors where, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's two minutes and 30 seconds because yeah. that's what the market bears, you know, yeah. but, but then when I really do what I want to do, I mean, I actually yeah. have rock operas I've done. <laughs> yeah. So I do these concept albums. I do these big things. And it's just like, cause that's kind of where I came from. I, 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 I like, I used to go see the who mm -hmm. do Tommy all the way through or go see yes, do like, one of their like uh you know one of their two hour albums like every song in the album like that's it you know so i'm kind of from that age of of, of people doing those big elaborate maybe too yeah. much <laughs> uh it, it got people it got people kind of made punk come about because people were sick and tired of yes like turning their back to the audience or elo turning their back and just noodling for like 30 minutes um but like I was one of those guys yeah. that liked that, <laughs> it's like that, like the Rick Wakeman was doing like a twenty minute solo <laughs> on his mini mode, <laughs> but um, but you know it's like it, it is what it is, and I think everybody can take. Yeah, I think a lot of these modern bands like they sample a lot of the stuff that I love. Like they sample Funkadelic, they sample, you know, old jazz Coltrane records. You know, there's a lot of interesting choices made by a lot of people doing interesting music today and I, i'm always like very keen to hear people taking samples of stuff that's yeah. kind of not not I typical agree. that that yeah that's the hip-hop i think the underground hip-hop where people are you know sampling mm -hmm. you know like bebop jazz or sampling like 1930s yeah. like, you know, like blues records and then i'm like that that that's that's yeah. cool that's like that's cool absolutely <laughs> 
But I'll take you up on that collectively. Yeah. I'm going to definitely check that out. Just, just send me a little, um, just in case I didn't get it down right, just send me a little uh, note through the through the chat yeah, sure. on Instagram so I don't that. forget. Um, so, so under, so it seems like I answered a question that you've been doing this online stuff so that you don't have to worry about having to do the physical shows because you can't, right? You guys can't really yeah, do I mean, shows there, in New York, right? There are really no, no venues open for anything right now. So. Yeah, the only thing I saw was like in mm-hmm. LA, they were using drive-ins. Like you had some artists that some indie artists were able to figure out how to do drive-ins. Um but that's kind of like a car culture out there. So that's more likely to be able to do that in New York. I mean, what's not that cool so about the would, streaming, um, uh, you know, what's, you know, the live streaming is that, you know, I did a set for Houston, uh, modular Houston, you know, a few months back, you know, and it was, you know, they, they just needed someone to fill um, a slot. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it for you guys. And it was like, you know, I was performing for people in Houston and then, you know, two weeks ago, I was performing for, you know, the group in Seattle. So it's kind of like, you can, you know, you're, you're touring, but you're not leaving. <laughs> you're not really going, yeah. you don't have to go through the, you know, the rough patches of driving yeah. everywhere. Don't have to have my road case in my, in, yeah, I don't have to have my U-Haul and all my road cases and worry if somebody's going to yeah. clip my mixing board, you know. <laughs> Somebody, you know, because I actually the problem I had when I toured is like suddenly mm-hmm. some of my pedals are gone. <laughs> suddenly, it was like yeah, my mixer is exactly. gone because <laughs> you know it's like that's it's like every time it's like okay, well, how, what am I gonna lose this time? Nothing breaks either, so <laughs> you know, which is nice. Yeah, well, yeah, with the modular gear with the modes, I'm like, okay, am I really bringing my mod or am I just gonna stick with my roll and stuff? Yeah, and then that stuff doesn't I mean, go I'll, down. I'll just bring my micro cord <laughs> and my and my sampler. <laughs> That's all I'll take out. You know, everything else. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know, we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out. Like, I might get like an MC seven hundred seven, and then yeah. just put everything into that, and bring like like a like a key lab, and 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 then have everything kind of already mm-hmm. in the seven hundred seven. Or that, or an Akai Force. I've been looking at that that because I've been using like a Keystep Pro, which actually works pretty good with a JDXI and a System One M, and those are like dead reliable because they don't. They, you, I brought them around; they get banged yeah. around. They don't really crash out. Um, yeah. And the System One M, what's cool about that thing? That's very much like like it's all analog behavioral modeling, so it can pretend to be like an analog synth, but it's digital. Uh, and so it works pretty good and even has CV, but it's, it's, it's digital, but it, it can feign, it can mm-hmm. fake being analog. Um, and, and, and because it's like dead reliable, it's a really cool thing to bring on the road because it doesn't really yeah, give Yeah, the control. Force looks cool. <laughs> yeah, then they actually got a song mode now. When it first came out, it didn't have a song mode, mm-hmm. and now it actually does. So you can actually load songs. The only thing I think the MC707 actually can load faster than it does that's the one problem i heard is the the force doesn't load that fast so if you're trying to transition from song to song it doesn't load as fast yeah, as i mean you that's where like another to. sampler you um, know just do the trick yeah you got to have something to transition from one to the next which has always been the core problem with all electronic music and why you had too too many modes on the stage to the transition yeah from or one we just the throw on a drone <laughs> yeah. drone and reverb uh, all the way yeah just throw it in the drone, put it through the LFO, and then switch yeah. over to something else. My, my favorite is just make the get <laughs> sure. a reverb pedal, just make it fully wet and a super high decay. And it's like I'll repatch everything real quick, and then you know fade it all back in. That's what I like about the Beat Step Pro because it loads projects like yeah. milliseconds, and so if you got all these projects on it, you just go boom, 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 and it doesn't skip a beat and it it keeps on running kind of like the old one a little mm-hmm. bit before it gets into the next one yeah so it feels like like a dj you can just bounce around pretty good in the in the new one uh the key step like the keyboard version of it is even better because it's fully polyphonic so the, you can do a lot with that. that that i think that's a good choice for people doing live shows yeah uh, at least i've had good experience with it coming but, out you know and it's only gonna get crazier 
So, I mean, which is fun, you know, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even using my OPZ, you know, with the, with the, with the CV enhancement, you know, running a modular rig off of OPZ is, is really cool. I don't know if I've ever used the teenage engineering OPZ, but it has these like little step components that allow you to like do multiple like effect type of stuff on every step oh, that's on really the cool. sequencer. And then so on every step you have these little micro steps. And you can have up to like 16 micro steps on oh, each 16 crazy. steps. And then you can have it you, then you can have it run an analog rig. And you can have all these projects loaded in like the Beat Step Pro, it seamlessly bounces between projects. And so you can actually kind of DJ with it where you could have like 16 projects built into it. And then while you're in a performance, take project one and then merge into project four and then go back to project 10 and go back to project oh, two wow, and keep really on bouncing cool. around. And then you can use that to kind of seamlessly do a show into things like the size of a TV yeah. remote, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, that's like the ultimate, like, yeah. okay, I'm on the plane. What do I have? And they take that in the 707. Yeah, that's and really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just interesting today. There's so many different tool sets out there that you can jump into. Since you're a make noise guy, are you thinking about uh, a strike? Not, I mean, I think I'm a little geared out right now. Burned out on I mean, I was looking, <laughs> you know, I was looking at, you know, maybe, you know, getting a new case. Uh, you know, the, the other manufacturer that's really interesting to me is uh, the Instruo, Instruo. I'm pronouncing it right. It's like they have oh, like yeah, really yeah, cool yeah. modules. Yeah, I think I see. They're that. always sold out, like on all like the places I look at. It's like, oh well, I'm never gonna get my hands on those. <laughs> so, you know, but I think I I kind of do want to get an another case and just slowly accrue those modules. But I think the make noise, you know, I'm pretty flushed out with you know. Yeah, you must have a full rig. You got a full. Yeah, like, I, I have. You know, like. Ready. You know, I, I have like the um the morphogene, you know, I have two maths, you know, I have the single oscill uh oscillator synth, the STO and um teleharmonic, yeah. which I which I love. I, I love those. Yeah, I wanted that. That one you I, know, I and still got I think better. what I'm slowly <laughs> getting, you know, loving more is the mimeophone. Oh yeah, the mimeophone is something I was like I, I gotta get another case. I was gonna go get like a bunch of their yeah their new stereo I, modules, and and then I was gonna get like the that that the Mimeo phone looked really cool. I was I, I was really I, I saw something from Loop Pop on yeah. it because Loop Pop is like I mean like, the God. Mimeo phone and Morphogene <laughs> make, the the Tempe Morphogene and Mimeo phone. It's you know I I'll just link those three up. And, you know maybe I'll use like a a filter like a q pass or something like that but you know i can just sample you know piano riffs and you can make like these crazy soundscape like ambient soundscapes just you know with those three yeah. that, that know, machine is great things. for doing that you can do, do some crazy stuff like i have the, the morphogen is like <laughs> yeah like I was looking for samplers forever, and then then I read about the Morphogene, and then I saw it like Loop Pop using it, and I said, well, "Yeah, you know, like that's um, it. what was it? I, I have a I have a YouTube video. I have like uh, my YouTube channel has a, more live streams. You know, I I was gonna throw them all up on um, iTunes and Spotify, but I mean they're they're mainly just jams. You know, the the two I have up there were a little more thought out. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, the ones on my YouTube channel um are more jams. But I basically just took. Yeah, the Morphogene, Tempe, and Mimeophone, and I just, you know, mic'd my uh, ukulele, and I just played random, like, just, like, some chords, you know, some strumming, you know, just some mm -hmm. percussive elements, and you can really, yeah, it sounds awesome, like. You end up being like the Edge, you know, if you, if you ever look at the Edge, he's got this big rack. and he strums, like, two notes, and he, like, deconstructs yeah. it. That's basically what I was rack. doing. It, it's kind of like yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I think that's cool, like the idea that they're doing that, and like the granular synthesis or field mm -hmm. recording. Like I love, like you know, take a book and run it over a microphone and bring it yeah. into a morphogene, and then the, like the pages coming through the mic, 
you know, that makes like very interesting rhythmic sounds. Uh, and there's just so many things you can do with the whole idea of field yeah. recording and then taking like analog yeah. filters, like running through, like taking a state variable filter and then, you know, using the notch filter or something and compared to the ladder filter. And that's what I love about my Arturia 2S is I got these state variable filters. It's totally different than the ladders. And you can do a lot of really interesting percussive things on my Arturia that you don't, yeah, you know, my morph, I mean, my, my DFAM can do a lot of cool stuff, but there's something about the state variable filter with the notch. Uh, mm-hmm. It allows you to do some really interesting Definitely. things. And uh, I, I love Arturia for the, the, the what they, their, their synths are totally different. It's a different character. It's a little more metallic, more, you know, like wood blocks and metallic sounds and kind of weird, uh, Ambience is different than Roland's, different than Moog. Yeah, and I use it for what it is, you know. And that's that's a really interesting way you can do today with so many different tool sets and just the the the, 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 the micro nature of things. You know, you can get these really small rigs that can do this amazing stuff, and you're like, wow. Um, you don't have to have your big phantom coming yeah, on yeah, stage the, or your those workstations. Or I you mean, know. you know, they solve their place, you know, for some people. But I think well the RD piano, I still love it. You know, if I need I want to do one of those big grand pianos, then yeah. it's like, okay, fine, that's gonna sound good. But yeah, it's cool. But yeah, I'm I've been more interested in like a subharmonicon, you know, just because of the, the all the different like polyrhythmic stuff you can do with it. I, I, I that's probably like my next rig I'm gonna get. Just because I think there's a lot of, and I was looking at the make noise. Um, yeah, uh, I was zero actually control, looking at zero control, which and has the harmonicon. Actually, a few months ago, I was like, "Oh, should I?" Yeah. Uh... That, that's a good combination. You could do some really cool stuff if you take those two together. That could run like a lot of modular stuff. I seen a couple of guys running, yeah, like Mylar melodies. He was running, running like the zero control. On, on a rig, and then he was running like a, a three tiered Moog with a D fam. Yeah, I saw that one. 32 I saw that video. It and really and cool. a subharmonica. Yeah. And it's that, that's kind of like, kind of like a Moog easel. <laughs> yeah, the, the sub, you know, just the subharmonics. Yeah. You know, I use the maths to crank out some subharmonics. Um, yeah, math can pretty much do what the summer market it's does. I saw a loop pop on that. You clean. can get it to I, do. I wouldn't say it's. It's not as clean, I guess. Not, not as clean. Precise, but you can get but some think, of the stuff to happen. You know, in an in, in experimental nature, I think you can have fun with it. But I think if you want, you know, full fledged subharmonic machine, you know, subharmonicon is awesome. But. Yeah, I never knew if they were actually going to build that because I was yeah. watching the Moog Fest when they did it. And I was like, that was the one that everybody wanted and didn't know if they were going to do it. Because um, they did a yeah. Voicoder one year and they never put it out. Yeah. Um, and then they did like the brother, the B fam, the bro- brother from another mother, and they never put that out. So now everything from that like that workshop comes out. And and we were wondering like is they are they really gonna do it? And then they finally did it. Yeah, <laughs> and they didn't I, have the money. I'm <laughs> hold off on the subharmonicon. I mean, you know, with the matriarch, you know, I could crank out some cool subharmonics. Oh yeah, if you have a matriarch, you probably, you know, it, it's just it's 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 a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know it's a, it is something that like it, it's an act it's a nice to have. Uh, yeah, I mean, because if I was like had a matriarch, like that analog yeah. delay really interests me and the periphery yeah. the periphery really interests me too uh, and the fact that you can make it like five oscillators you take that lfo mm-hmm. and flip it to like an oscillator um then then you've got kind of like a little profit five i mean it's not in tune like a profit five but you could do some interesting five finger chords yeah on definitely it. it's um, it's a fantastic machine you know i'm glad i found it i mean it's basically what convinced me to get back into music you know i was like oh maybe i should just stop <laughs> but i mean it's you know yeah but, you Mo know when i heard it back I was, in. you know the <laughs> oscillators i was like oh man that sounds so good and it was it's it's yeah my grandmother did that for me because i was kind of yeah. getting tired of my juno and then i'm like 
what's going to keep me motivated. And then I got my grandmother and then I've been using yeah. my grandmother since the day I bought it. And it just, it just, it just brings the life into the recordings. I, I heard this one story before we go that like when the DX seven came on the scene, like recording engineers loved it because it yeah. didn't take over the mix. Right. Like the analog sense did. And then that became like the death knell for all the analog sense could be recording engineers like the way you could mix it easier and it didn't blow through the mix. But the one thing they forgot was the way those analog syncs blow through the mix is actually yeah, like why uh, people like it. <laughs> you know, it, it brings that kind of warmth and the depth that when you have the digital sense, you don't have that. And, and that's why I think a lot of people have come why they want a Moog, you know, why they want a Prophet, why they want an OB6, you know, it's because they want to bring that kind of character back into the, to the music and, and to have something that's like, yeah. oh, that's a real heavy bass line, you know, or that's a real, like, screaming lead, or that's a really interesting pad off of Prophet 5 or something. There's, like, there's something about those, those, like, Jupiter and Oberheim things that it just why people, you know, got into electronic music is because some of these iconic instruments, you know, that they, they got them yeah, like, down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it's just, you know, you, you need to, I think with like a lot of, you know, especially if you're running a lot of oscillators, you know, on your rig, it's easy to kind of, you know, suffocate the spectrum. Um, so you kind of, you just have to be careful and just give everything space to breathe. Um, Yeah, I mean that's where you like the the pauses yeah. or the silences in music, I think are yeah. important. Like we get a lot of people get into like how many tracks you're gonna have, and I'm kind of go back to like Prince and Dirty Mind was mm -hmm. the fact that it sounded like a demo, you know the fact that, you know when Doves Cry reason it kind of hits is because it sounds like a demo. It, he didn't keep on layering it; he actually left a lot of space. And if you listen to like you know Joy Division or Early New Order. It's the space and like they're not the, not doing the overproduction, right? And deciding like where to like mm -hmm. leave it, leave it bare. I think that kind of adds when you have that those type of sense and things is to be able to leave the space between the notes, so people can kind of feel the full impact of it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's like a that's just like you're the, when you're a producer, yeah, you have to kind of figure that out. <laughs> Well, it was great having you on, Bandit, and uh, I'm going to take you up on that on that, um, that your your um, collective there, and and see if I can get out there and do some of the cool things. Because you know, and then like if anybody in there in your collective wants to be on on our show for an interview, they can get in touch with me, um, and I'll be feel free to set yeah, sure. something up with anybody in the collective. And in you in in the future, if you have a, a new release, we always have people come on the show to push their next uh, project. So we do that from time to time. We have multiple people come back multiple okay, times. Sounds on the show, great. So. It was uh, great speaking with you. Well, this will be out within an hour and uh, we'll have all the, we'll put a link on for your, we, the hyperlinks that you have uh, given me or I've seen out there for you, I, I can include. And we will be on 11 podcast platforms once it generates including Anchor FM, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Uh, a couple of more to talk about, like Overcast and Radio Public. But pretty much 11 podcast platforms will get this, and we'll awesome. push it on yeah, our I'll Instagram it story too. as well. Okay, thank you yep, for being no on problem. the show, Bandit. Have, have a nice night.